hey 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 welcome back i am excited to be filming this video this is the video that i look forward to filming and editing and this is the video that i look forward to watching at the beginning of the year because people get to talk about their favorite books and then i get the opportunity to pick up some titles that maybe i hadn't heard about just yet so i think all around it's just a win-win situation i actually enjoy making this video more than i enjoy making the worst books of the year which by the time that this video goes up you should have already seen that so i don't want this video to be extremely long because we all know your girl can talk 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 so let's you know go ahead and just dive in i have 20 books these are not in any particular order it was already difficult enough to choose 20 books i read over 400 books last year and granted some of the factors that helped me in making this list were or was the fact that I eliminated comics, graphic novels, and manga from the entire situation because of everything that's going to be posted on the Realm of Comics channel. So that did help take out a good percentage of what I read last year. However, still, there was a sizable amount of material left and it was just difficult sifting through everything and making these final decisions so some of these books are not exactly five star reads for the year i think that some of them just keep sitting with me and i keep thinking about them and they had some sort of emotional impact but a good portion of them are five star reads so i just wanted to add that starting at number one off the top of the list we have violetta by isabella allende this was my first allende book i had never read her before i'd heard such amazing things i have yanni to thank for that because yanni had been telling me to give her a try and i had gotten a copy of violetta via libro fm as an advanced listening copy and I listened to it and it was just beautiful so the story itself basically covers a life of a woman over the course of a hundred years starting with the flu epidemic and ending with the COVID pandemic and it was just beautifully done we are following this woman who takes charge of her life doesn't let anyone tell her how she should live how she should feel and it cost her in some situations and she's writing her story to someone and you don't know who the story is being written for until you get to the very end of the book and I just feel like it was lyrical it was beautiful there was so much history interwoven into it a lot that I learned which is a great thing for me as I think about my around the world reading challenge and being more intentional in my translated reading this book is translated so I just appreciated all of that I appreciate it so much that I did end up reading a second book by Isabella Allende this past year and that was a Japanese lover which was just as good I did not make a space for it on this list because I just wanted to go with one book by one author instead of doubling up but when I think I did like my mid-month what was it I think my mid-month uh, best books of 2022 like so far mid-year not mid-month I included both of those books because they were just beautifully done and I can't wait to dive into more of her backlist this year the next one that I have is Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan which I was not expecting to love this as much as I did. So this is based on the myth of the moon goddess and it follows her daughter who is not supposed to actually exist. She's been hidden until finally she has is kind of forced to come out into the open and she has to deal with the emperor and his family. This is the first book in a while that I've read that deals with a love triangle in a way that I I appreciate it this is the also the first time that I've read the trope with lovers to enemies which I had never seen before it was completely and totally fascinating I know that the second book it came out in November I still need to pick it up I just November and December were very very interesting months this was just written beautifully and in a very very accessible way I know that there's been so much conversation about whether this book is classified as YA or as an adult I think it really just depends upon what bookseller you're going to or even what library you may be picking this up from like I know personally our library does classify it as adult fiction but I think that it is a good transitional piece 
piece between YA fantasy and adult fantasy. It is a chunker over 500 pages, which is why it made me so nervous because your girl is not really a fantasy reader, especially when it comes to adult fantasy. But I believe that it was just written in such a way that was captivating and fascinating with so much mythology and lore woven into the context of the story that it just kept me really, really intrigued. And so many twists and turns that I did not see coming. I think that when we got that shift where we had two characters go from lovers to enemies, I was like, dang, like this is harsh. My, my heart felt for all of them, like for everybody, all parties involved. And it's interesting because we get to see a little bit of that play out in the beginning of the second book, which is why I'm so ready to dedicate some time and sit down and actually read it. It's just a really, really great book, y'all. I love Daughter of the Moon Goddess. I speak highly about it. One of my favorites of last year, definitely, clearly, because of this video, I, you know, whatever. Clearly, I'm just rambling at this point. But I, I, I cannot recommend this book enough. And it's just a duology, and they both came out last year. Please just pick the book up. Pick it up, pick it up. It's worth a read. The next one that I have on my list should be of no surprise because it's one that I've talked about before, and it is I Must Betray You by Ruta Sepetys. I absolutely adore everything and anything that Ruta Sepetys does in terms of writing historical fiction. I love that she has this philosophy, and I'm assuming it's her philosophy, but she's just proven it through her works, where she writes young adult historical fiction that focuses on little known pieces of history or major events from the perspective of individuals that we don't often get to hear from. So like, for example, one of my favorites is Salt to the Sea, and we get to see World War II, but from the perspective of people from Lithuania, which is not something that I even learned about while getting my history degree, which is something to be said about that. But this one that I read in 2022 that I ended up loving was set against the backdrop of the 1989 Romanian Revolution. This is a time period in which the country is under a dictatorship. They don't have access to their most basic needs, whether that's adequate electricity, medical care, food. And so we're following perspective of a main character by the name of Christian who has been forced to term and be turned into an informant because he was caught with illegal currency, which was a US dollar. So we follow him day to day. And it was interesting is that his narrative is kind of, I guess, broken up by someone else that is possibly informing on him. And it's very, very fascinating when you figure out like who's watching him and who he's watching and how all of this works together. And we follow these communities as they begin to rise up. This doesn't have a perfect ending because in reality, one of the things about the revolution is that there was this fear that things would just simply go back to normal. That the tr that distrust had been so deep rooted in everyone at that point that you see the transition of one power to another only for the same things to continue to happen. And it's really unfortunate, but I think it's one of those small pieces of history and not really, I mean, y'all, we're not even talking 50 years ago. So with that being said, it, it's, it's a modern piece of history that we don't necessarily get in secondary education here in the United States. So I was happy to read that. Definitely a five star read. I think this year I definitely want to focus on reading more of Ruta Sepetti's backlist. The next one that I have on my list is actually a picture book, which if you know me, I read a lot of picture books. One of my goals for this year was to commit myself to documenting and reviewing more picture books here on this channel. And the book that I decided to go with for this slot on my list of 20 is Dear Reader by Tiffany Rose. This is one that I believe I received as an arc early at some point early in the year, probably January, February. It focuses on a young black girl who loves going to the library, loves checking out all these books and getting lost in these imaginary worlds. But unfortunately, every time she reads a book that features characters that look like her, it's all trauma. And so in this 30 page book, we're getting this complex conversation about the issue in publishing that comes with balancing trauma and joy. And I know that that's a conversation that's been had amongst some circles here on booktube, especially in the black community about writing for the white gays or writing to educate white people instead of writing books that really just genuinely give a clear cut 360 perspective of the black community and black experience. Now, what I do say in all of these conversations is that publishing has an issue with balance. It doesn't mean that those who want to discuss racism 
are not or don't have a place in the publishing world, but it seems to be a hyper focus on those stories instead of finding that perfect balance between the two. And this is a story that does capture that conversation very, very well. And we see a young black girl just enjoying reading. It is a love letter to libraries. So many great elements. The artwork was beautiful, very colorful, bright palettes, of course, which is not unexpected, but work very, very well, even with the complexity of the conversation that was happening in the book. The next one on this list is If the Shoe Fits by Julie Murphy. I was so hesitant to pick this one up. I actually only ended up picking this one up because Disney sent me the second book in the series by, I forget who wrote, Jasmine Guillory wrote the second one, which is supposed to be Beauty and the Beast retelling. I haven't heard great things about that one. But before I picked that one up, I was like, you know, I'm kind of low-key interested in picking up this first one. And so I did pick it up. It was excellent. I think that If the Shoe Fits is everything that I wanted one to watch to be. One to watch was one that I ended up reading, I think in like 2020 and did not like it at all. It has kind of the same vibe, like both of them in terms of we have a fat plus size main character that is entering a reality TV show that is a dating based TV show. And of course they have their conflicts while they're there. But this one was the fat rep that I was looking for. So we're, it's, it's a Cinderella retelling essentially. And we're following our main character, Cindy, who is using, supposedly is attempting to use this reality show as a way to showcase her shoe designs. And she has such a great support system. I think that was one of the things that I was very, very afraid of whenever I began to read this book is that Cindy was gonna have a horrendous stepmother and awful stepsisters, but honestly, they were family. And I'm glad because she didn't have both of her parents. So I'm glad that Julie Murphy made that change and structured it so that she had a strong support system. And, you know, Cindy was confident. It was a kind of recognition of yes I'm plus size yes I'm fat but I don't need anyone's validation that's the energy and vibe that I caught from her which as someone who is fat plus size I really did appreciate that level of confidence and it does take time to get there but to see that on page was really really rewarding and it's not to say that Cindy didn't face any backlash or any comments from people who seemingly intended well but were horrible in their delivery and what they were saying and just not great at all but I think that she just did such a great job and with the character development of her intending to go on the show and to showcase her shoes and finding out that it's so much more than that really built for a very beautiful story it just kept pulling me in pulling me in put me I could not get enough of the story I think that my only hiccup about this one was that I think that I wanted more energy and power from the ending but I thought that the romance was really really sweet I thought that the relationship developed in such an organic way and the characters were just great y'all this was excellent writing and like I said, it was everything that I had wanted one to watch to be. The next one that I have is one that I wished more people would talk about. And I haven't seen a lot of people talk about it and I wish that they would. So here I am to talk about it more because I have talked about this one in detail before. And it's, does my body offend you? I randomly picked this one up. I can't remember why, what caught my attention about this one because it wasn't cover appeal. I think I just, it was around the time and not saying that conversations haven't happened, but conversations had spiked in women and girls having autonomy over their bodies. And I just randomly decided to pick it up without reading any type of description or anything about it. This book follows two main characters. It is told in alternating perspectives, Melina and Ruby. Melina is displaced from Puerto Rico after a hurricane destroys her home. And so she's moved to Florida and Ruby has moved to Florida from Seattle. They both attend the same high school on the first day or within the first week of school, Melina is reprimanded by her school officials because she attends school without wearing a bra because she has such intense sunburn that wearing a bra really, really hurts her back. So she goes without one. There's much to be said about the beginning of this book where it discusses how there are dress codes in place for young women and girls because it is deemed as a way to lessen the temptations of young boys and men and so we have certain length skirts you must wear a bra you must present your body in this way shape or form because of the fact that we don't want to tempt young men and young boys and it was so many issues with that first 
that whole that whole idea because people really do believe that it really perpetuates the idea that young women and girls are responsible for any type of sexual assault that happens based on the attire that they wear and the problems in that feeling idea philosophy is disgusting and so that's touched upon this book also focuses on how viewing black and brown bodies is significantly different than how white bodies are viewed especially in young women and girls when black and brown bodies are hypersexualized and we see that in contrast between melina and ruby i also appreciate the fact that we talked a little bit about white privilege ruby is a very social activists i'm going to use my voice and stand up and melina is much more on the quiet side and what i loved and appreciated about this book is ruby got checked because even though ruby knew about white privilege she was engaging in white privilege and in white savior complex because she kept attempting to push melina to speak stand up for yourself i will do it for you i will da -da 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 -da. it was just excessive to the point where melina and her friends had to say like stop we understand you're trying to help, but you're speaking over the voices that need to be heard. And so it, it, it happens a lot. It happens a lot in this community where people have the best of intentions, I think, but still end up centering themselves and making the narrative about them and speak over the voices of the communities that have been impacted. And I'm glad that the authors did take it there and were willing to have that conversation. I will say that there is a content warning for this one. There is sexual assault that does occur on page. So be mindful of that before diving in. So the next one on this list, you all should not be surprised about. It's one that I have talked about so much on this channel. And that is The Lesbianist Guide to a Catholic School. This was written by Sonora Reyes. And it is such a beautifully written book. It follows 16 year old Yamilet Flores as she is attending this Catholic school and she is a lesbian and she is dealing with a lot. There's definitely some conversation here about dealing with racism and classism and having to be around predominantly white spaces while being a person of color and being queer at the same time, which it's a lot there it's it's a lot and you see our main character go through so much with those factors kind of woven into the story but let me tell y'all something the highlight the part of this book that i love so much was was two i don't know why i said one there's two the writing was beautiful i loved their writing it was so great it was so beautiful it was I don't know how to describe it. There's, it's like this writing where you just can't get enough of it. And so anything that they write from here on out, I'm going to pick up because the writing alone is great. And I loved the brother and sister dynamic in this book. The two of them had to rely on each other in ways that I did not expect. Our main character, Yamalette, is struggling because she doesn't want to come out to her mother. She is working to save up money because when the day inevitably does come, she wants to make sure that she has enough money in her pocket to be able to stay somewhere, which in itself is just heartbreaking. She comes from a Mexican background with her family that believes strongly in the ideals of Catholicism. And it's tough because trying to find that balance between faith and identity and you see that play out on page and her and her and her brother they need each other so much and in ways that i think they didn't expect in ways that you actually don't expect as a reader until you get about 75 percent into the book then you realize like oh wow like they are each other's pillars they are each other's support system we get to watch them go through everyday things their relationships ups and downs attending school dealing with parents that are not going to be happy about some of the decisions that they think they're making we have a father who has been deported and is pretty much absent from the picture he communicates with them but he's not physically in the house so there's just a lot of elements in this book but i think that it was handled with such grace and compassion and love that i couldn't help but to admire and love everything about this book the next one that i have on this list is one also that i've talked about so freaking much i've talked about this book time and time again over and over time after time good old cindy lopper okay Listen, I love Confessions of an Alleged Good Girl so much. Joya Goffney is an autobi author. Autobi, hands down. I literally will read Joya Goffney's grocery list and it takes a lot for an author 
to make me feel that way. That passion and, and fire that I feel just for their existence. And Joya Goffney is one of those humans. She's absolutely amazing. I did not know what I was going to think of Confessions of an Alleged Good Girl because it's so much more than I think the premise gives. It feels like, okay, we have this main character who is struggling with being able to be sexually intimate with her boyfriend and they've tried and she counts this over 20 times that they've tried and she literally just can't because it's too painful and it's this conflict of okay I know that probably my first time is not going to be comfortable but there's something else in this is not really adding up so he ends up breaking up with her and she starts off on this in this journey of trying to figure out what's going on with her body so that she could be ready to have sex with her boyfriend. And then it ends up turning into so much more. I love that this book was so open about sexuality and being sexually active and knowing your body, being comfortable exploring your body. There's discussions about masturbation in this, but it's done in a way that it's it's conversations it's done in a way where it's like these conversations should be happening and as a parent i'm happy that books like this exist because listen i i know that that's conversation is going to happen i'm going to have to have that conversation with my child but it doesn't make it any less comfortable uncomfortable for me as a parent to have that conversation it's awkward it is just it's just awkward because you nurture this being from the point that they are just a little wee thing to the time that they become you know teenagers they hit puberty and it's like i don't want to even think about you thinking about doing said things but it is normal and this book normalizes sex and it normalizes understanding and knowing your body there are people my age all who still do not understand their body because they didn't have the environment or the framework to have healthy conversations about that and it's not like oh we're talking about sex in a gratuitous way we're talking about it as this is something that humans do some humans some humans don't there are things that you have to learn about your body that it's perfectly normal to explore that it just i oh it was so good and and it talks about purity culture from the perspective of a black religious family i think when people think purity culture they think synonymous with white girls and fundies and it is not just white people who deal with purity culture i am telling you but it's just not something that's talked about in the black community and it has such a negative impact on our youth the idea of purity culture the idea of we're not going to talk about this the idea of i'm not going to teach my kids about sex the idea of i'm not going to encourage my kids to understand their body from an anatomical perspective to understand how their body functions to practice safe sex like we just don't do it and so this book is a book that is going to break some generational traditions and i could not praise joya goffney enough for writing this damn book if i had to pick a number one favorite book of 2022 i promise y'all it would probably be this one because i get so passionate and fired up about the work that she did in this book it's beautiful the friendships the relationships the reckoning with the parents the broken relationships that that need bending when we start to explore religious bigotry in the black community and being queer and having to come out in the black community is a completely different experience like oh my y'all oh if i give this book a million stars i would if you have not read this book stop everything that you're doing stop this video stop watching stop doing whatever you're doing go see if your library has it see if you can find an ebook copy see if you can get a, an audiobook of it something just just read it you gotta read it the next one that i have on this list is finding me um by viola davis this is her memoir that was whew, this was a this was a memoir it was beautifully written and it definitely talks a lot about Viola Davis's experience growing up and the way that she grew up and then her experiences in Hollywood and some of it in terms of what she was experiencing in Hollywood I wasn't surprised about but I think that even hearing it it still can be jarring things that people 
think Hollywood may have gotten over with in terms of when we're, you know, gender and race and it's still not as, it's still not where it should be in terms of access and opportunities. I think that one of the things that I appreciated her discussing was her role in the help. And there is a lot to be said about taking on that role and how she inevitably felt about performing in that movie. I don't know too many black people that liked the help. I mean, I could be wrong. I just know like in my immediate circles, it was not something that people necessarily enjoyed all the time. And I had a great grandmother that was the help. I have a stepfather whose grandmother was also the help and it's not as beautiful and as easy as that movie made it seem and it definitely had the white savior complex in it and so there we had a discussion about this movie as a family so it was just interesting hearing Viola address that movie herself. This was a favorite memoir of mine this year. I've read a few memoirs this year. I probably am aware between like five to six memoirs this year and this definitely was a standout not in terms just of content because I think all of the memoirs that I read this year definitely had some difficult content and as I always say I really do respect people for having the willingness and the openness to tell their story and having to relive those difficult moments in their life but I think that Viola's for me was just the most cohesive and the most well written and just the way she told the story it's clear that she has a gift for storytelling and i just I, I value that so much okay so the next one that i have on this list is one that i'm gonna i'm gonna be looking down at my phone for this one because i want to talk about the content warnings in this one because this is a why a horror fantasy and the content warnings for this one are a lot it is hell followed with us by joseph white andrew joseph white and i really enjoyed this book. With that being said though, it is a lot. It is one of my favorite reads clearly of 2022, but the content warnings on this, which the author has also shared on Goodreads, is um, violence, which explicit gore, arson, murder, and mass murder, including children, warfare, terrorism, body horror, transphobia, misgendering, dead naming with name written out repeatedly, threats of transphobic violence, forced detransition, Religious abuse, Christian terrorism, combined with elements of eco-fascism, abuse of parents, and a domestic, domestic partner violence, including returning to an abusive partner and victim self-blame, self-injury, including attempted suicide of a side character, and emetophobia, which is vomiting warning throughout, without warning. There's that. It's a lot. How Followed With Us is, like I said, it is a dark YA horror fantasy that follows a main character by the name of Benji who is trans and has essentially been turned into what is called a seraph which is a play on a lot of religious terminology in this book. There are actual bible verses woven into the narrative of the story which is also very interesting. I really want to get a physical copy because I need to reread and annotate this but it's a it's not literal all the time. It is the fact that Benji has been turned into a bioweapon to create this mass destruction. I think that there is much to be said about the transitioning of Benji into the Seraph and paralleling with actual medical transitioning. I do not have that lived experience, but Audrey from Perpetual Pages provided such a thorough and great review of this book. So I definitely recommend checking out Audrey's review. It's a very, very interesting and very well written kind of paralleling going on there. One of the biggest things that I took away from this was the fear that I felt because while this is a dystopian fiction horrific world, it is very realistic to some thoughts and ideals that people have in our reality. This idea that I will take vengeance into my own hands and I will do vengeance in behalf of on behalf of God and I will punish those that I don't think are worthy or redeemable of God's grace and while this is an extreme version of that it to me felt like it really wasn't that extreme of a version because 
people feel that way for real, for real. We see it play out all the time. It is a form of terrorism against certain groups where you have religious extremists who believe that if they are not living up to their perceived values of God, then they must be eliminated. And we see this play out in a different setting, but it's still the same ideals playing out across pages and man oh man that was that was it was rough there's definitely great character development here we see benji just be human making some mistakes and benji goes through so much because they were raised in a religious cult and being raised in this religious cult you see them having to deal with the back and forth the mental trauma of having not let alone the emotional and physical trauma that occurred but just mentally having to deal with the back and forth and dealing with a partner that was a part of this and still is a part of this religious cult and is abusive was abusive and still continues to be abusive it it is a lot i i do not take this book lightly and any time that i have talked about this book or anytime i have recommended this book do not go into this book lightly and do not take this content for granted because it is something that is disturbing but it is a story and narrative that i think needed to be told and it ended up being one of my favorites of the year. The next one that I have on my list is one that was definitely unexpected. I struggle a lot with books that get a lot of buzz. I always think that, oh my gosh, if I read this, this is I have such high expectations that it's not gonna live up to my expectations and it's gonna disappoint me. And so I, I really do, I have a tendency to struggle with books like that, but this lived up to the expectations. Delilah Green does not care was everything and if Ashley Herring Blake continues if everything that she writes is like this I'm in for some trouble and I know that the second book in the series has officially come out I do have it on audiobook just once again gotta make time to actually read it you know stuff like that read read the books that I want to read continue the series that I need to continue but this follows two characters and it's Delilah and Claire so Delilah pretty much has made this vow that she was never going to go back to her small town because of the fact that she you know once she left she's like I'm not going back she has a very strange relationship a strange relationship with her stepsister Astrid because of the dynamic that she had with her stepmother. And what ends up happening is that Astrid asks her to come back to, I think it's called Bright Falls. She asks Astrid to come, I mean, she asks Delilah to come back to Bright Falls to photograph her wedding. And then she runs into our other character, Claire. One of the things that I really appreciated about this romance book is that there's so much complexity and this is the epitome of like bomb ass character development. So both of our main characters, Delilah and Claire, face both external and internal conflict. And it wasn't done in a way where it felt like it was too much. It created a robust kind of 360 perspective of our characters. So you have Delilah dealing with the idea of this conflict that she has with her strange sister Astrid, but she's also dealing with this internal conflict of self-worth as it applied to the way her stepmother made her feel. Claire is having to work out her feelings with Delilah while also working with the relationship that she has with the father of her children, of her child. So, I said children, of her child. So so there's, there's just a lot woven into this entire story and while like I said while it may seem like it's a lot it, it's really not because even the side characters felt complex they had issues of their own as well but we got such a great perspective of everyone that I felt everyone was just super well developed it led to a very fascinating and interesting story Ashley's writing is just so fluid and beautiful and once again, one of those writers that kind of just keeps me wanting to dive, dive, dive more into the story. I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more. And there's a lot to be said about that. I mean, a whole lot. Okay, y'all. So the next one that I have on this list is Tumble. And this one I definitely added because it had a huge emotional impact on me when I read it this past year. It focuses on a young girl by the name of Addie Ramirez who lives with her mother and her stepdad. Her mother's currently pregnant and her 
she's having some issues adjusting essentially that's what it is she feels like it's a lot going on because her stepdad Alex wants to adopt her and while she likes him as a person she just feels like at this point it's just too much too quickly and she ends up showing interest in getting to know her biological father her mother is not as on board with her trying to figure out who her biological father is and I felt this on so many different levels because she had to come to this kind of conclusion within herself the mother did and letting her child figure out something that she already knew so Addie does go through the process of figuring out who her father is Addie is also super into wrestling and she finds out that she has some wrestling roots on her father's side in her family members and it makes her really excited but the journey and finding her father and getting to know him is probably one of the most heartbreaking narratives that I've experienced in middle grade and I think a lot of that had to do with the simple fact that I am so fearful of when that conversation may happen for me and it is something that no parent wants to have to do because you know the other person and you've experienced the other person and you wish the best for your child but you know that the likelihood sometimes is just not there and it sucks because sometimes you have to let your child go through that and be there to pick them up and put the pieces back together when they end up inevitably do get disappointed which is what we see play out this is one of my favorites i know that this is i think this is not the author's second book. The first book that I think they was the first Rula Punk, which I've heard a lot about. That one is an award winner and one that I definitely need to check out because Tumble was just so well written and I adored it. The next one that I have on this is Midnight Mass. And I really honestly, y'all, I can't talk about Midnight Mass at all. There's nothing that I can say because this is a sequel to Priest by Sierra Simone. And this was my first experience reading Sierra Simone and I really, really did enjoy my read of it. Midnight Mass essentially is what happens after for the events of priests so we follow the characters after their HEA which is a tricky narrative to write because you know for romances the HEA HFN and to see what happens after the fact can kind of sometimes ruin that picture perfect image that we have of a couple but I do feel like it's reality it's realistic but it's tough it's one of those things where it's like it's super tough to come to terms and reckon with your favorite people not being perfect and these two definitely have gone through a lot a lot a lot so I like I said this is one unfortunately because if I say anything about this book really um, it will spoil the contents of the first book but I can say that Sierra Simone does some very interesting conversations between the idea of faith and love and faith and love for God and faith and love faith in and love for another human very interesting kind of back and forth there the push and pull of those two things I absolutely loved it I know that this series is kind of taboo because it does feature a priest falling in love with you know one of the people who comes in to make a confession and yeah so but it was well done both books were well done but Midnight Mass definitely stuck with me and it will continue to stick with me the next one that I have on my list is Refugee this is a middle grade book written by Alan Gratz I definitely know that Alan Gratz is popular amongst middle grade readers people adore everything that he puts out but I had never read anything by Alan Gratz and Refugee just happened to be available at my library I picked it up it follows three main characters one and takes place during different times different places it is a character that is living in 1930s Germany and is Jewish there is a character that is trying to flee Cuba in 1994 and then there's a third character that is trying to leave Syria in 2015. So the whole concept of these three perspectives is that they are all refugees. They're all leaving their homes in order to find sanctuary and safety somewhere else. This book is gritty. It is dark. It is violent. It is violent on page and I was not expecting that but I think that Alan Gratz still did it in a way that is I think 
accessible for a younger audience, not so violent, just, you know, like violence for the sake of violence, but very much so a window into seeing the experiences of other children. One of the most beautiful things about this book was the writing and also the interconnectedness of these three storylines. So I was thinking that we were just going to get a narrative in which we're just following three separate stories and giving just three different kind of outlooks on what it means to be a refugee, but that's not true. All three of the stories are connected in a way, and it's sad. <laughs> it's so sad when you figure out the connection towards in the book. This is definitely not going to be my last Alan Grads book. I really, really did enjoy Refugee, and I'm looking forward to checking out some more of his other books. Next, I have another picture book, and this is Black Eyed Peas and Hawkeye Cheese. I was so excited when I saw this book coming out, and I definitely got my hands on it as soon as my copy for the library came in. This focuses on a young girl who's spending time with her grandmother during New Year's to really help prepare the meal that's going to be served that day. And they talk a lot about where the traditions come from. Like, why do we have black eyed peas during the new year? And why do we eat this? And why do we eat that? And as she's in the kitchen helping her grandmother cook, her grandmother is explaining the connectedness to slavery and it is a good balance of not just the negative or the harmful aspects but also the communities that were built amongst black enslaved peoples and it really pushed back against the narrative that black people only eat horribly and there's a lot to be said about food accessibility in this whole conversation but this is for a younger audience but there was a challenge of like oh yeah we only eat this this and this and it's like no we had access to you know tons of vegetables and that's why we eat turnip greens and that's why we eat collard greens and stuff like that so you know just Picture books are valuable, y'all. I'm telling you. And Black Eyed Peas and Black Eyed Peas and Hawk Head Cheese was one of those that I absolutely ended up adoring. Uh, the next one that I have on here is a nonfiction history book that I ended up seeing uh, purchased for my library. It was available on Libby, and I just randomly decided to dive into it. I had no idea that this was going to be releasing this year. It is half American, and it focuses on the experience of black individuals that served in the U.S. military. Now, going into this, of course, I had heard a lot and knew a lot about Double V, which is Double Victory, Victory Abroad and Victory at Home. I had learned that when I was in secondary school as well as when I did post-secondary school and got my degree in history. I knew a lot about that. I took a class that specifically focused on the black experience, but there were more details in this book than I anticipated in terms of just certain actual like protocols that the US military had when it came to black Americans wanting to serve their country and fight for their country and still were treated like shit and were willing to put everything on the line and were willing to die for a country that couldn't be so bothered to give them rights back at home. It just never ceases to amaze me that that is a thing that we still can't seem to acknowledge the embedded racism that has been woven into our military branches. I will say that this is a nonfiction book that is extremely accessible. It's it's told in short enough chapters that I think that it's easy to digest and it definitely reads more biographical the way that it's, I don't know if that makes sense, but it reads biographical the way that it's sectioned off. So it's not like dry historical nonfiction like I think that people always get worried when they see like nonfiction that's history based like oh no like this reminds me of like my 10th grade history class absolutely not this was written in a way that I think is the narrative was accessible the information included was accessible it didn't feel like information overload it's just enough to give people an overview of exactly what was happening during that time period how it impacted the black community the important figures who were involved during that time all of that stuff is included in that and so I I think that that's one of those things that I appreciate about this, even though I'm definitely more confident in my nonfiction reading. I think I can definitely recommend this one as a beginner nonfiction piece if you're interested in history at all. Next, I have Nana by Brandon Massey. I went back and forth about this one when I first read it, and I think that Nana is just brilliant. Of course, we all were reading Nana because Brie from The Lock Petition absolutely loves Nana and loves Brandon Massey. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to read it. It was Black and Thon. I was like, you know, Brie always talks about Brandon Massey. I'm just going to check it out. And I know that some people have issues with Nana because of the way that it is told and the fact that us as readers have 
we have more scope of the situation than the characters involved. So that means we know what's going on before they do. But I think that there's much to be said about how Brandon Massey intricately talks about two things that I want to mention here because I don't want this to I don't want this to be full blown review. The idea of us knowing more as readers is I felt was intentional. And we see that in our main character whose name is slipping my mind when it comes to Grace. So Grace is this woman that pops up, forgive me for not remembering the main character's name. Her grandmother had passed away and she never had a relationship with her mother Grace. So Grace randomly supposedly pops up at the funeral and wants to rebuild this relationship. As a reader, you already know, like, hey, hold up, girl, like this. I don't know about you, but this ain't sitting right with my spirit. Like, something about this woman is not right. But our main character just never sees it. It's just certain things that Grace does that she says, the way that she begins to change physically over time. You just are like, yo, like, sis, like, how do you not see what I don't see? I think that's intentional because Brandon Massey was pointing to the fact that grief and longing for a fixture in your life, especially a parental figure in your life, will make you blind to everything. So what we could see as viewers, our main character literally could not see, which made sense as to why her husband Troy, how can I remember everybody's name but this child's name? Anyway, her husband Troy could see it too. We as readers, we saw it before Troy, but Troy saw it after us, but our main character just could not get it. And you have to understand that she just lost the only maternal figure that she had ever had in her life. And so when you have this woman who's coming along, who she's wanted to have a relationship with her entire life, comes along and says, you know, let's make amends. I want to fix this relationship. She's not going to see anything. Even when she starts mentally and physically falling apart, she still doesn't get it. And I was like, how could she not get it? But the more I thought about it, it's not the intention is for her not to get it. It shows how we will avoid and ignore everything just to make a relationship work. Whether that is a familiar, a friendship or a romantic relationship, we will do anything to make things work when it's something that we've wanted and longed for for such a long time. The other thing is that this includes a grandmother nana who likes to have sex she's very open about she likes to have sex she's a very sexual being and it disturbs readers it's intentional why do we feel like older people do not have the right to be sexual beings why do we feel that way it says so much about us it's ages we feel like at a certain age you shouldn't be having sex you shouldn't feel sexy you shouldn't want to feel desired you shouldn't want anybody to touch you on a physical level that's not right that's disgusting that's gross you're too old just because you age doesn't mean that that desire necessarily goes away that doesn't mean that you don't want to feel beautiful that you don't want to feel wanted that you don't want to engage in sexual activity with another human and Brandon Massey challenges us because you're like this isn't like she wildin' how she this old talking about sex like that and he makes you check yourself because in your mind you're like wait hold on who am I to be saying that she shouldn't desire sex why should I be making that decision on behalf of her because of her age? It's ages. As a reader, you become ages when you start thinking. About it. It's just the complexity behind it to me was so fascinating that I just couldn't afford not to put this on this list. And I, I appreciate Brie for even exposing all of us to Brandon Massey. I can't wait to try more of his works this year. Next one that I have on the list is Attractions and Distractions. This is the first book in the Attractions and Distractions series. It's Attractions and Distractions freshman year, which is the first in the Attractions and Distractions series by Alexandra Warren. I had bought all four of these, I think in 2021, and I had gotten them signed. And I was like, these have been sitting on my shelf too long. I need to just go ahead and read them. They're actually on my shelf somewhere. I just... Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna, I didn't feel like disturbing my shelf. They're over there, but I just didn't feel like disturbing my shelf today. So I just kind of, I just refused to do it. Anyway, this follows a main character who is moving to from one side of the country to go to the University of Southern California. And she has sworn off all men. <laughs> She's sworn off all men because her father has not been a great human and so she just doesn't engage with men like that. When she gets to the university, she finds that, honey, that's not how it always works out. And so this book is messy. It's messy, it's got love triangle vibes that I think I didn't mind. I thought that it was a hot mess. There was a lot of great sexual tension, a lot of great 
angst, a lot of just Alexandra Warren just doing her thing. I love this series so much. I read the first book in less than 24 hours and I read it physically in less than 24 hours. So they're not audio. I read that one physically in less than 24 hours. So there's much to be said about how much I really enjoy the series. I ended up reading freshman year and sophomore year. Hopefully this year I'll get through junior and senior year, but honey, boy, if you like mess, that's that's the series for you. The next one that I have on my list is Onyeka and the Academy of the Sun. This is one that I wish people talked about a lot more. The second book actually comes out in March of this year. I enjoyed it. This is a new, fascinating, fun middle grade series that follows a main character by the name of Onyeka who has this magical hair. So her mother basically starts with like, you know, hey, you know, I need you to be mindful of your hair. Cause she's going to the pool with her friend and mom's like, don't get your hair wet. Well, she doesn't listen and she does get her hair wet but her friend also ends up starting to drown and her hair starts to show these magical abilities and she's just kind of weirded out about it so her mother does explain to her that she is part of this magical group and so they travel to take her to an academy that i think they call the solari i believe that's the name of the group she's taken to this academy with other solari so she can learn more about her abilities and how all of this stuff is interconnected to her missing father this was just really good it's definitely x-men vibes but what i did like about this book is that while it does give you x-men vibes the characters are written in a way that makes them distinctive and so while you're getting the vibes they don't feel like they're just straight copycats of x-men characters like of course our main character definitely you're, you're thinking like oh yeah storm vibes like yeah but she is her own character and gets her own character development this first one i will say just so you know is definitely more so about the world building and getting to know the magic system so the action packed part of it is towards the end of the book but i love the world building and the magic system so much that i didn't mind that the action was towards the end i i was perfectly fine with that because it was just unique for someone who's a fan of Marvel and who understands that X-Men is such a complicated kind of piece of the Marvel Universe of its own to see that kind of translated in a middle grade fantasy book was fascinating and also because it contains so much social commentary on black hair and loving black hair and appreciating black hair and finding confidence in your black hair because we definitely see that within our main character. I hands down am excited to get to this next book in the series. I probably will do a reread of it before I dive into the next one but we'll see. And the last one that I have on my list is going to be Bad Guys. I know this is probably like by Aaron Blakely. This is probably very interesting <laughs> very different i decided that i wanted to read the bad guy series this year it's a very very popular series at the library kids absolutely adore it they love it it's their favorite they appreciate it and i was like well what's all the fuss about the bad guys especially with the movie coming out and i read it and i understand it literally follows a wolf that is trying to be good is trying to kind of flip the narrative on how people view the big bad wolf. And so he enlists the help of some other bad guys who are supposed to save the day. But instead of saving the day, they, they scare the shit out of everybody. And it's like, because if you are a shark and you were like, I wanna help you, like you're a predator. And if I'm typically your prey and you're like, I wanna help you be like, hell no, I don't. It's so much humor that I think that this is a book that both parents and kids will enjoy. This is a great like read aloud, like bedtime read aloud, especially with those who are transitioning into chapter books. Love, love, love bad guys. I cannot wait to continue with the rest of the series this year hands down probably going to want to be going to be one of my favorite children's chapter book series out there so yes all right y'all so i know that was incredibly long but you know when you start talking about your favorites you gush you gush you gush you gush you gush and you just can't help yourself so definitely let me know in the comments down below what your favorites were for 2022 as always if you like this video give it a thumbs up if you want to see more content from me click the subscribe button hit the bell for notifications all of my links to follow me on social media and support the channel are down in the description box below and i will be back with another video soon